this week on Hermitcraft. I somehow fell off. And when you take this L and project it, big L. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is Loy XP. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. And at the time of writing, Demise has officially ended. Throughout the beginning of Season 10, the Hermit struggled to dodge deaths by causes both natural and unnatural, and there could be only one winner. But for now, we're not going to tell you who it is. Mostly so the information can circulate naturally through the Hermit's own videos, but also because it's more fun to announce who became the server's Highlander when we know what the prize is. So hopefully we'll find out by this time next week. In the meantime, it's been fun to watch the last few living Hermits squirm as the rest of the server becomes increasingly anxious to see them perish. Those of them who already got busy dying find other ways to keep themselves occupied, like calling meetings of the Neighbourhood Watch and handing out silly hats. So let's put on our silly hats and take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Vintage Beef, who has the strange honour of throwing Joe Hills into a pit of pufferfish. There's water there. How is that dangerous? Oh, there's pufferfish. Oh, that is a different type of peril. I did it! A reluctant Beef is named Minister of Maps, but is kind of unofficially Minister of Terraforming, which explains how he was able to remember exactly where that pit was. And to be fair, the server needs a Minister of Terraforming when the two most common demise strategies involve pointed dripstone fall traps and TNT minecarts. Minist-trying. Minist... Minist... Anyway, despite removing himself from the pool of targets, Beef is still the victim of several non-fatal pranks, two of which target his careful remodeling of the neighborhood landscape, and one of which pallet swapped his entire house. What just happened here? Who did this? My house! Don't sit there looking all cute! You did nothing! <laughs> I've, I've just noticed be Beef's building. house, he's managed to make it make Neverack look good. Yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> there it is! There it is! What? But Extreme Avoid, for everyone who doesn't know, cannot act, okay? So that is the <laughs> this is true. most genuine, <laughs> that is the most genuine thing I've ever wow. heard. You know what it is? It's jealousy. It's jeal- Somebody is jealous of my beautiful terraformed oasis. Iskal is quite insistent on adding colour to Beef's house, until Beef is quite insistent on subtracting life from Iskal's horse. Oh no! no! You killed the- <laughs> Beef! I uh, will never forgive you! You killed the Swede! In Iskal's defence, he probably wanted some company, because his own starter build has been a block salad from day one. It's also a great excuse to stage the demise of Wells Knight under the pretense of setting up the right camera angle. Good. Now you have to promise me something, Esco. You have to promise me that this is not in any way demise related and that you will not kill me. <laughs> I promise not to kill you within the next two, uh, 15 minutes. You see the little acacia there? Right there? Yeah, yeah, little, little. Bye, Wells. Sorry. You lied to me! You broke your promise. I can never trust you ever again. Some people can't get enough of adding to the build, specifically Mumbo, who challenges himself to add as many blocks as he can without Iskal noticing, but Iskal restores balance by asking Grian to artfully remove 32 blocks from the monstrosity. By the next time we see it, the whole thing has been condemned by Cleo's Ministry of Trash, but it's a good thing Iskal has made spontaneous plans. He tears everything down and builds a large stone obelisk, carving runes into the sides and filling them with the blocks everyone contributed. It's a monolith he's worried might look out of place, but then again, he's voicing this concern to someone whose base is half a skull. You well, well what, do you, what do you think then? Do you it's love it? Cute. Where's the monstrosity gone? This is the monstrosity. What is that? Why is there a... What? <laughs> why is there a... <laughs> what is this? Wells Knight tries to pay it forward and develops a whole redstone system to turn people's mineshaft water drops into a fall trap. Hilariously, false symmetry is immune to that because her mineshaft 1 is a stairway. With XB Crafted's place rigged for fall damage though, Wells returns to his base to relocate and redesign the bridge we last said was blocking a boatway, and also landing in Hypnotized backyard, much to his chagrin. I wasn't like super, super happy with it. I think we're going to do bridge take two. This continues until Wells finally puts together an arch design the fishing boats can pass under and can put this ever giving situation to rest. Talk about a troubled bridge over water. I don't know. I'm going to play around with some more detail things and see what I can come up with, and uh, hopefully when it's all done, it'll look good. As one of the last few people still in the running for the Demise Prize, XB Crafted becomes increasingly paranoid, which is justified because people are trapping his safe falls. I'm going to go down, but I'm so worried that it's like there's more to it. I see. Look, 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 look. I'm sure we're fine, right? Fortunately, his starter hole in the wall base is straightforward enough that he can basically play spot the difference and clock any changes before they literally blow up in his face. 
He even has neighbors who are kind enough to act as the canary to his mining operation. But as he mines the land, land mines turn up with increasing frequency outside his base, and it's rarely a surprise to see smallish beans pop up like Wily e. Coyote after he's roadrunned his way out of the latest TNT trap. No! Oh! <laughs> he got himself! <laughs> False Symmetry in the meantime discovers that nowhere in the rules does it say she can't just murder any and all red names that show up to her doorstep. Her PvP prowess helps her dodge a few close calls with falling dripstone, peak amongst the assassinations being the one time an advancement notification informs her that there is in fact a skulk sensor under her house somewhere. Skulk sensor or warden? Or warden? I can't currently go in my base right now, so I'm basically homeless. I'm just wandering down the server doing <laughs> paths. B00 has also been struck by the paranoia of sticking around this long, so he starts this week approaching his base like a bomb squad, one which has decided to decorate with a lot of unlit fuses. We've got some pressure plates here, stepping on it. Everything's fine, nothing explode. Taking the diplomatic angle of bargaining with the Reapers, he leaves some signs promising them a share of the prize if they agree to leave him alone long enough to win. But this state of diplomacy doesn't stop him declaring war against horse fakes, which seems to mean Corallis. You've lost your horse. Oh! Branching out from that, he builds a tree. And while he promises to add leaves later, the wind tree feel and tough grey bark seem quite appropriate at this end of the year. And then some of it, you know, there's some kind of messy stuff that'll get covered up by the leaves eventually. Ever the helpful fella, Cubfan brings in plenty of greenery, even if it's for vintage beef instead. It's pop I'll try to put it's popping. Now equipped with shulker boxes, Cub takes no time to hit up Beef's base and completely unload his sizable stockpile of poppies from the iron farm around his house. Uh, Still have no idea why we did this, but it was totally worth it. Absolutely. Me either, but I got really sleepy. There was something about just place. Play. The red dye market successfully crushed. Cub eyes the next few developments for his home farm array, focusing on slime blocks first, and then expanding the operation to honey with a unique farm that recycles the bottles it auto crafts with. Anything else can be farmed up with the bones from his skeleton spawner, now that bows at least are carefully allayed out to a separate loot pile. And it's good to see a use of allays that doesn't involve them being permanently set on fire. In that sense, Doc M77 seems to have seen the error of his ways, although he does drag some allays into hell to sort the rotten flesh from the gold in his early game piglin farm. A lot of work went into this one again, like Massets and Tuno to name and a few others. This is of course linked up to an adjacent bartering setup, so Doc now has quartz and a bunch of other resources on lock for the foreseeable future. With that done, he can turn his attention to Big Salmon, and at first his attentions seem respectful enough, but when he invites the fishy goodfellas to inspect his salmon monument, it turns out to be bait. Uh, Any time! Three. three, two, one, let's go! Go! Oh, no. <laughs> Peace! I'm you dying. better crouch! Fuck. Fuck. I'm, dying order. <laughs> order, I'm dying here! I'm dying here! Hypnotized becomes a victim of a much more directional assault, the direction, of course, being downwards. I got your stuff, Hypno. Dude, bravo, bravo. Ijevin plays the Mole Man and catches Hypno standing still long enough to drop him down a pre dug fall trap. Truly, nothing is beneath him. Know how long I've, I waited for 31 minutes in that spot. I didn't know you and were waiting. <laughs> as if inspired, Hypno actually spent a lot of time digging up an area for his government mandated iron farm. This saves the server a necessary but weirdly shaped structure floating over the community area, but also gives Hypno a reason to fight a wither for a haste 2 beacon. Get down there. There you go, there you go. Every time these golems spawn, you can get three to five ingots per, so with four of them we should see one to two blocks every single cycle, so every minute. He also puts a splash potion trap at XB's house, because trapping XB's house is a rite of passage at this point. I mean, so this is the the first one I didn't, like I knew there was something, I just didn't know what. XB, I see you're still alive. It really is a shame. <laughs> The state business earns Hypno a custom model top hat with an iron golem head on the brim and the pumpkin blur still in effect so you can empathize with the iron golem some more. Not all is well with the official neighborhood business. For one, the hat budget really cut into the making the meeting room fund, so the whole shadow government hosts its meetup down an actual toilet. And technically it's only a shadow government when the light is working. There's a complaints uh, box with a complaint saying <laughs> this building is terrible. <laughs> Can we get out of this place, please? Yes, I'm yes, please, to feel queasy. yes, please. I'm, I'm starting to feel queasy, actually. Luckily for them, the group actually gains a Minister of Light in the form of Wells Knight, even if adding his home to the map of the neighborhood means a whole lot more work for Vintage Beef. Also luckily for them, Zombie Cleo spends the whole meeting with their microphone muted and unable to protest in a way that matters. I did wonder why you were ignoring me. What do you want from me? <laughs> 
I've got my biting sarcasm on my end, it's fine. Worse yet, while everyone else on the government payroll got a top hat with a custom sigil, Cleo here got a bucket hat, clearly. They still make their opinions seen when they designate the General Rendog Tower area as the trash processing unit, and also de-abbreviate the iconic RD into rubbish dump. To their credits, they also make it clear to Iskal that unless he does something about the mess of blocks he has for a house, someone might add between 24 and 32 blocks of dynamite to it. Not I that have you have not built, built it. Actually, you, you have, have built it. It is, it, it, is, it is improved, actually. That's not improved. That's extended. There's a difference. Ren's tower isn't the only thing about him that got rebranded. The rubbish dump makeover convinces him to move out, and with it, he moves out of his role as Minister of Ministers, reframing it as Minister of Administration, which feels less like I'm in charge of these people and more like I'll sign off on the hat allowance. There's been other ministerial work around here too. The Minister of Hell has done his job too. Um, A for effort. It also frees him up to reinstate Gigacorp as the driving force behind his build project. And if you aren't familiar with his corporate overlords, he provides a crash course in what Gigacorp stands for and why the heck it has blueprints for a starter house that looks like a modular moon base. Standard issue Gigahut, which I'm hoping has some sort of communication device within its wiring networks. Still, Ren's loyalty lies with his fellow hermits first, and this time the farming corporation takes a turn to Azumavoid, who's been taking a swing at tree production already. Agreeing to expand his auto pickup tree farms together, the two almost reform the log fellas of season 4, though the mind controlling rabbit is sorely missing. <laughs> I'll take care of the never then. Okay, I'll take care of the bamboo. Awesome. It's going to be a hard task, eh? Because I have to travel really far, you know, it's going to be a dangerous, treacherous journey. Yeah, to find the bamboo. sure, sure, gonna, sure. Gonna I've seen terrible, that massive you know, bamboo farm outside of the base. I don't know what base. you're talking about, X. I don't know what you're talking about. It's good timing, too. Azuma may be on the verge of a breakthrough in the bone mealing business, having accidentally discovered a way to perpetually supercharge a vine of glowberries using bee pollinating mechanics. For the time being, it's not without an issue, and is in fact an issue because those bees are proper stuck in the hole in the ceiling. But it's nothing a professional key beeper can't handle in his designated brie beating area. And that's why I came over here and started setting up a temporary brie beating area. Brie beating? I knew as I was saying it, I was saying it wrong. Also, he has a skeleton spawner nearby anyway. None of the skeletons have big head mode enabled, though, otherwise they might look a bit like Stress Monster's base. Oh, oh <laughs> this reminds me of Season 7. So In a big brain move, Stress is starting with a skull that's a throwback to her Season 7 jungle base, although the references don't stop there. She plans to use it as the entrance to a larger base inspired by her past builds. But the latest updates have brought in fresh blocks, and she can actually use the cherry blossom leaves as a flower crown this time. I suppose the alternative would be her current headgear, which as Minister for Farming has more rotten potatoes than she'd like. Skulls are also on her mind throughout the rest of the week as she and Iskel head off to a convenient nether fortress to farm enough wither skeleton skulls for a few wither fights. Although even the wither skulls aren't quite as threatening as the warden head pearlescent moon bags, purely so she can mount it on an oak block and make creepy noises on demand. That's a nice rumble. He's got to really think about it. Oh, he's talking to the ocean. All right. He's got he's to get those thoughts translated real quick. Pearl can't stay away from the deep dark for long, because later in the video she joins the group who raided an ancient city at an early opportunity, and the fact they all make it out alive just gives her more reason to team up with Corallis and trap Azuma's nether portal. No, that's not that. I've been trying to kill people for the past few days, and I've been failing over and over and over again. Uh -huh. Pearl, help me kill somebody, please. Joe Hills is another participant in the deep dark raid, although he's the only one sensible enough to swipe the security footage. Perhaps because surveillance is sort of on his mind. He conducts a few additional surveys of the area surrounding spawn, and eventually finds an unclaimed area which might work for his long-term project. Through a picture-in-picture -picture PowerPoint presentation, we learn that the area is inspired by Homedale, New Jersey, and among other things will basically be a sculpture park the Hermits can contribute to artistically throughout the season. Joe's sister Quinn contributes artistically to the second half of the episode, providing a musical soundscape and a legal witness as Vintage Beef flings Joe into a hole filled with pufferfish. There's water there. How is that dangerous? Oh, there's puffer- Ah! Oh no! Oh no! So for anybody who wants to see the new Demise skin, I wanted- I was going for like... Muppet that washed up on shore a little bit maybe? This is somehow still not as much cruelty as the fish show Grian, by being caught instead of a mending book, mostly. Against all odds, Grian has now fished for over 5,000 fishes, but never has gotten the mending book he so desires. Fish caught, 
4,399. I don't even want to begin to calculate exactly how long that's been until I get a mending book. Determined not to have to deal with villagers at all, he keeps the habit going, just targets a bigger fish for a bit, and together with Gemini Tay, assaults a guardian monument for the sponge, prismarine, and whatever other treasures it may offer. The mastery of the rod and an active email account soon revealed to him the secret pig in a boat technique that allows the ocean cult to launch people even higher into space, especially with two of them in the boat. They even successfully send Etho back to his home planet. I have to go now. My planet needs me. Oh, oh it looks like it goes so well. Yeah. But with Prismarine, Warped Wood, and Oxidized Copper now all available, Grian finally starts the real work on his home base, which is now not just a floor, but also walls. Not to quote the bare naked ladies, but it's been one week. Skizzleman is one of the first to volunteer for the latest developments in the Hermitcraft space program, although he has more banter for the new space age look adopted by his neighbor. Perhaps it's fitting that Karma revisits him later in the form of a witch. I gotta get the efficiency, and I, I would really like to get mending, but I, I think you said we can't get that on the table or something. <clears throat> After washing off the potion effects, Skiz makes a start on clearing the foundation for his Pyramid of Needs, and it turns out a pyramid he needs is a beacon. But once that's cleared, the walls are in, and he immediately needs a second and third opinion from Grian and Gemini Tay, because the whole thing seems too big. I need more blocks! Oh, I have- Is this- It's huge! Is this your I'd base, Skiz? i you do need more blocks! <laughs> Shut up! Skiz. Still, as a wise man once said, Wobi to sin biyasa saps diafu. Wobi tin sin biyasa saps diafu. Essentially, it's a wall of explanation, even though I'm sure it's not needed because you're all so awesome, supportive, and patient. So thank you again for understanding. I mean, if it comes down to it, just go ahead and remember the acronym. But let's rewind a few sentences here and really take the time to appreciate Impulse SV's new look. This is how true friends treat their friends. Ready? What do you think, Skiz? Think maybe if Wario had a son and he became a meth addict, but other than that... <laughs> Gosh. How did you make it worse? Having tied in his Minecraft skin and accessories with the Dwarven base last season, it's still a pleasant surprise to see Impulse fully embracing the cyberpunk aesthetic, down to the neon shades, the chin strap beard, and the French fry hairdo. After setting up a few basic resource farms in a nearby abandoned mineshaft, he's ready to turn one of the parking bays of his first office building into the soup store, so you finally have somewhere to buy some clothes. Well, I can't find them. What do you mean you can't find them? I can't find them, there's only soup. The fishing cult land is about to get way more ambient, now that Gemini Tay has gotten her hands on the authentic Elder Guardian noises. Maybe you a skulk thing or something and you're like walking along and suddenly yeah, this. Like you walk into a certain part of your base and it's just like Whoa. I that fits my vibe. Though the heart of the sea they dug up on the way back also helps plenty when Gem needs to prepare the area for her build for the week, the lighthouse. Why'd you spill your beans, etc. I am adding fish to the part of my base that is air and not water. There it is, cow. Never mind that the iconic spiral here is white on white, and the body of water it guards is a river in the first place. Joel Smallish Beans, the land boat, is already using the tower for its intended purposes. I, I genuinely, when I'm out on the ocean, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm lost. And then I see the lighthouse, I'm like, I'm here, I'm home. It's that is the cute. best thing anybody's ever said. <laughs> Thank you. Joel overall is attracted towards the glowy bits this week, as we see him focus on a glow squid farm and a dedicated building for it. This is quite understandable given his build style for the season and how much of the stuff he already burned through. The sashimi place is not quite open yet due to the lack of anything inside but the two pet glow squids. However, Joel is kind enough to give us an MTV Cribs tour of the main home, which you'd think we were making a joke, but he actually does. That little segment took way longer to make than I'm willing to admit. We get something similar from Etho, although currently the magic happens outside the build because the inside is still a couple of platforms leading to an enchanting setup. Dude, this house looks like a hurricane just came through, took out half of the <laughs> house. <laughs> Never do their backsides, man. What it's all good done, man. Right? Uh, working yeah. on. The exterior, on the other hand, gets a hanging sign motif as Etho remodels the bridge, adds an open air gardening space and a furnace array, along with a very flappy bone meal based flower farm. So we would come in here, we'd flip up the trap doors, and then flip the lever. And we're out of bone meal. <laughs> His major project is a creeper farm, which gets a brief nod of approval from Doc M before Etho takes a few stacks of TNT out to gather resources the explosive way. Because mining using the wither was good for deep slate, but might not be advisable elsewhere. Etho's explosive ways come in handy immediately when Pearlescent Moon summons him and Tango Tech to start a joint venture. With player communication at an all time high, Pearl figures Hermitcraft could use an extra communication channel. And so the three set out to bring mail to the Hermit kind. 
and unsurprisingly, Tango and Etho take this opportunity to immediately go postal. With the idea of setting up a redstone-powered automated package delivery, the two blow out a tunnel through the nether and populate it with frequent nether portals to serve as dynamic chunk loaders. While all the user has to do is place their shulker box and give it the name of the addressee, the system actually runs their items through a railway until the right portal in the system is found. So for starters, you'll see this upper track. It loops down there, comes down here, and it makes a big L. Needless to say, this is a welcome addition to server infrastructure, given how much this season has already been sending me. All right, we're peaking. We're going to peak. I think we're peaking. I don't think it's working. Ah. Oh. Where to get stuck? Let's find out. Big L. For now, however, the only thing they accomplished was the ability for Good Times with Scar to send things to Etho, since those two are the only two people connected to the system. He unreal. threw it. Oh no! He said, put it, he said drop. Freaking hold down. Get here. down there! I'm gonna mail you. Come on. Uh, and it's fitting, seeing how Scar is the man with the biggest rail network on the server, as in the rails are real big. Oh, He's got look the at curve you, and everything. Track boy. The moose out front should have told you a park still closed. <laughs> Ethan, did you get that reference? Please tell me. This rail is quite important because it also connects his locomotive to the main cherry mountain of the area, and the caboose installed behind the main locomotive is certainly bringing his starter home closer to the rest of the group. And of course, our track going all the way into the mountain where in our next episode, we're going to make a really cool tunnel employing some fun new effects. And finally, there's Mumbo, who was feeling on top of the world for a minute there. And then I somehow fell off. Did they just, did they do all of that just to punch me off the top of the world? Despite being thus elevated, he's still not certain how to get into a starter base that's dangling a few meters off the ground. The structural chickens he adds in the meantime clearly contribute aesthetically, but they don't provide much upward momentum. A structural sheep would be overkill for this scale. So he eventually settles on death warping himself into the base, setting his spawn inside and inventing a mechanism that can fling items from the nearby hillside into his storage chests. My base is completely accessible. Everything is working properly. With this conundrum solved and having recalculated the value of his own life, he goes out to prank Scar by borrowing a silk touch pickaxe and pretending to throw it in lava. And given that he gets a diamond block out of it, he's only got to run that scam a few hundred more times before he's back on the way to being the richest hermit. Kind of need that silk touch back, so... <laughs> Here goes, I got nothing. Mambo! That... It looks like he burnt it in fire. Why was he in lava when he was going to get ice? Why are you buying ice? Get this lava. Door! And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.